Hi, everybody. I'm just waiting for everyone to get in, and it looks like we're all here. Okay, so welcome to a new semester of Eating the Past, which is a collaboration between the Utah State University Merrill Kazir Library Special Collections and Archives and the History Department housed in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. I'm Jennifer Duncan. And while I'm currently the interim dean of libraries, my real day job is as the curator who oversees our special collections books. Also joining us tonight as a part of the Eating the Past team are Tammy Proctor, professor of history, Jonah Bebo, currently a PhD student at the University of Nevada, Reno, and a former US history graduate student who serves as our production coordinator, and Alex Bullock, a graduate of the USU history department MA program and our incoming co-production coordinator. Before we get started, I would like to offer the following land acknowledgement. We recognize that Utah State University in Logan resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands in Willow Valley of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. The university resides on land ceded in the 1863 Treaty of Fort Bridger and other lands within our state. Today, we recognize Utah's eight federally recognized native nations, historic indigenous communities in Utah, indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. As a reminder, our Zoom series focuses on recipes taken from and inspired by the cookbook collections at the Utah State University Special Collections and Archives, which we use not only to document the history of the Intermountain West, but also to provide broader primary source literacy through the study of foodways and culinary history. The cookbook collections contribute to our broader understanding of historical economies, politics, and mentalities. All previous events have been posted to a library guide. Um, and Jonah, if you can go out there and grab the link and put it in the chat, uh, anyone who's listening tonight can go back and grab the previous episodes, the book information and recipes at your own convenience. And in, in addition, some of you may not be aware that our Eating the Past Zoom series has inspired a new Utah public radio show hosted by history department faculty and staff, Tammy Proctor, Jamie Sanders, and Jeannie Sir. The radio show runs at noon on Sundays right before the splendid table and is also linked from the guide that Jonah's gonna get into the chat at some point tonight. Um, so tonight, we're going to be hearing from two Utah State University scholars, one from the Department of English, and another from the Department of Art and Design. First up will be Dr. Christine Cooper Impato, who's a professor of literature specializing in the medieval and early modern periods. And she will explore the mysteries of the famous nine herb charm. Then Dr. Alexis Sand, a scholar of medieval art history and the Associate Vice President of Undergraduate Research here at USU, will join us to discuss the medieval foodways and a menu she has prepared inspired by the regimen Sanitatis. Thank you both for joining in on the fun and cooking tonight. And Jonah, if we can, or Alex, one of the two of you, if you can get the first slide up, I will introduce the collection materials related to tonight's presentation. Perfect, okay. So tonight, neither of our cooks has actually prepared a recipe that's explicitly included in one of our special collections items. However, I wanted to be able to point our listeners to related material in our collection. Both cooks have relied on documented medieval and early modern remedies or early modern health manuals. Christine will be preparing the Nine Herbs Charm, which is available in a circulating book at the Merrill Kazir Library entitled Anglo-Saxon Remedies, Charms, and Prayers from the British Library Manuscript Harley 585. And Christine, I'm gonna butcher the name of this. It's, it's in Old English the Lak Nunga, and she'll, she'll pronounce it correctly, I'm sure for all of you. Um, this 2001 standard library book contains the Old English and Latin text of a medieval manuscript with its parallel translation into English. Um, the original Lak Nunga or the Remedies itself is a parchment manuscript codex dated to the late 10th or early 11th century, and it's located in the British Library. And then uh, Alex or Jonah, can I get you to show the next slide? Perfect. Um, so Alexa will be preparing dishes inspired by the Regimen Sanitatis, a popular medieval medical work frequently reproduced in manuscript form. It first appeared in print in Latin in 1480 and was then translated into many other European vernacular languages. 
The first English edition appeared in 1528. We have a 1535 copy. It's a later edition of that same work that contains the Latin text of the regimen with an English interpretation and commentary. Um, the USU copy has a modern full calf binding and both the front and rear cover of blind staff ruled with decorative borders and a gilt stamp title label. It also includes several contemporary handwritten annotations that you can see in the slide. This book is frequently used by students of both medieval and Renaissance European history literature and art history classes. And it's been included in several student curated exhibits. So now I'm gonna hand the time over to Christine Cooper and Pato so we can get started. Thank you, thanks for unmuting me. I wasn't able to unmute. Okay, thank you. So here I am talking about the nine herbs charm and I just have on my initial screen here, some images, modern images of the herbs and plants that I will be talking about. Next slide, please, Alex. So in order to understand this nine herbs charm, we have to start with a little history. And so if you forgive me, I'm gonna be talking about the history of England. Um, over about 500 years here, but we're gonna do it relatively quickly. <laughs> so next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the first thing we need to know about is Anglo-Saxon England. So basically um, there were Celts and Romans who were living in England um, up to and through about mm, four, 420 or so. When the Romans go back because of the fall of the Roman Empire, we then have Germanic tribes that come over. And these are the Angles, the Saxons, the Frisians, and the Utes. And they start migrating over in the fifth century and then they settle. And that's where we get the word Anglo Saxon England from. But really, it should be Anglo Saxon, Frisian, Ute England. <laughs> and they bring along with them their German religion, their Germanic religions. And we think it might be similar to Norse religion. And the language that they speak is Old English, which develops by about 650 and it looks like German. So next slide, please. So then Christianity comes to Britain and I have here an image of a church from Eskom in Northeastern England here. And it's, an, it's a, a real, one of the four earliest Anglo-Saxon churches that are still in existence. So basically Irish, Catholic Christianity reaches Scotland and it's coming down to England from, um, goes from Ireland to Scotland and then down into England. But meanwhile, Roman Catholic Christianity is moving up <laughs> into England. Um, and they basically, the two kind of forms of Catholicism meet. And in the 600s is when England is converted to Christianity. And the Catholic church uses Latin here. And so next slide, please. Alex, can I go? Oh, thank you. So then we have an, another invasion <laughs> and we have what we call the Danish or people call the Viking invasions. And uh, basically people settle, Scandinavians settle into England and we have a period called Dane law or Anglo-Scandinavian settlement. And on the left here, I have an image of uh, an Anglo-Scandinavian shoe, which was found in York, which was called Jorvik, which was, uh, was a, quite a settlement for Vikings and then um, the Danes who moved there. And on the right is just a map of everywhere where the Danes went. So next slide, please. Okay, so when the, when the Scandinavians came, when the Danes came, they brought along their Norse religion with them. So they're bringing with them Odin and Thor and Loki and all of that. And they probably converted to Christianity rel relatively quickly because the Anglo-Saxons had already been converted for several hundred years. And these settlers, these and, uh, Scandinavians spoke Old Norse and they also learned Old English. And this is an image here from an 18th century Icelandic manuscript of Odin riding Sleipnir, the eight-legged horse. Next slide, please. So in order to understand like, how this, this nine herb charm was produced, we have to think a little bit about who was producing texts. So these Catholic monasteries that were, had developed in England and Catholic churches were basically writing manuscripts and they wrote these manuscripts on parchment, so on animal skin, and they were written by monks and nuns. And on here on the right, I have an example from a Latin religious manuscript from a collection of Psalms. And you can see how beautifully it is decorated here. And it's David surrounded by musicians and scribes from this wonderful eighth century Psalter. All right, next slide, please, Alex. So what happens in this 
the monasteries is that nuns, monks and nuns would have written in what we call a scriptorium. That's the singular, or scriptoria is the plural. And these were places inside the monastery where people were writing manuscripts. And so here you see a really wonderful image of St. Dunstan here at work writing a manuscript. St. Dunstan obviously is really well dressed and you know is writing a really beautiful manuscript. Um, I visited a scriptorium once and it was very dark and the lighting wasn't very good and you realize it must have been really hard to write those things. And here he is with his manuscript and um, he has a pen and it looks like he's also ruling uh, his manuscript and it could also be scraping any errors that he's doing. So next slide please. Okay, so the Lakmunga manuscript, which contains the nine herbs charm, was written on parchment in Old English, which is the language of the Germanic peoples who developed in England, right? Is written in Latin as well, which is the language of the church. And it has some old Irish in there too. So we know we have some Celtic influence in there. Uh, it is written either by monks or nuns. We do not know who wrote it, it is anonymous. And it was compiled in England, we know in the late 10th or early 11th century, and later on nicknamed the Lachman Road, which means remedies or cures. And here I have an example of the manuscript. And you see, it's not a really beautiful manuscript at all. It doesn't have nice illuminations or gold leaf. And that's because this is a manuscript meant for use, right? This is, um, they're gonna fit as much as they can into there and there's no need for beautiful illustrations in there. Next slide, please. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the Nine Arts Charm. So only one copy of this charm has survived, right? So it might've been, in other manuscripts, but it only survives in the left manga. It is written in Old English. It refers to nine plants, what we translate as herbs, but really they're plants, as well as a couple other ingredients. And uh, it is a magical incantation or charm for curing a wound. And I'll read you just, here's just a little tiny bit of it here on the right. And I have a translation below. It's a little bit um, corrupt this text. And so the manuscript isn't in the best condition. So editors have often filled stuff in. But here we go in Old English. Ye mini thu muk where twat thu almadorest, twat thu reinadest, ak rein malga, una thu hatis yoldest worka, thu meet with, and I'll three, <laughs> and with 30 in Roman numerals, thu meet with atre and with anthria, thu meet with sam laven ye yond van fere. And that's the opening of the charm. And the translation here is the very first stanza talks about mugwort. So remember you mugwort, what you declared when you first advised the proclamation of the gods, Una, you were named the oldest of herbs. You may, you may avail against three and against 30. You may avail against venom and against that which flies, which we think means probably contagion. You may avail against the loathsome one, the loathsome one which we think means plague, who travels through the land. And you can see it's really mysterious. What does the three and the 30 mean, right? What, what, what does this poem mean? So I would like to now show the first video from when I made the charm, thank you. So today I am making the Nine Herbs Charm from an English manuscript that is over 1000 years old. It could be as old as 1400 years. This poetic charm was written in a language called Old English, which looks like German. You can find translations of it very easily on the internet and they may differ from one another, but don't worry about that. So the recipe calls for nine plants, some ashes and some soap, and I'll show this to you in a moment. Uh, we have three immediate challenges in preparing the recipe. First, we can identify really easily six or seven of the nine plants, but two or three of them have given scholars a lot of trouble. So um, that's just because they're not called by modern names. So I have uh, done the best that I can in acquiring these. Second, medieval recipes don't ever tell you how much of something to use. They just tell you to use some. So I've also had to guess at quantities here. And thirdly, there are a few obscure passages in the poem which make it really hard to understand, but we will in the, um, the Zoom portion of this kind of work through those. So in our ingredients here, we have nine plants, which are called herbs, but the Old English word for herb um, is really much wider than our modern term for herbs. So some of these are herbs, but some of them we'll recognize as what we would call plants. So the first one is mugwort, which the poem calls una. 
and it's the oldest of herbs. It says, Una thuhatis virdus huerta, which counters poisons and contagions. Second, we have whey bread or plantain, also called dock. It's called the mother of herbs. Third, this one was the one I had some trouble getting. This one could be either lamb's cress or lamb's lettuce or corn salad. It is related, one of, them, one of those is related to valerian, so I ended up just going out and buying some valerian in powder form and putting it in there from a local health food store. Fourth here is nettle. Um, nettle is also said to cast out poison. Mysteriously, in the poem, it's said to be an herb that fought against the serpent. Right. They say, sail with more than me fiat. And it probably refers to a story that we no longer have. Fifth here is betony, which also they say mysteriously, quote, put to flight the lesser the greater, whatever that means. <laughs> if again, these probably refer to stories that we don't remember. This one is a form of chamomile number six. It counters infection. Seven is crab apple. These are little ornamental crab apples from my own prairie fire crab tree. I believe, you know, British crab apples in the year 1000 would have been a little bit bigger. <laughs> Eight here um, is we have fennel here, and it didn't specify whether or not to use the fennel seed or the fennel leaves, so I have seed here. And then here we have thyme as our last herb. Here. Then we also have soap, and here I have some soap from the Spirit Goat here in Logan. Uh, homemade soap often will contain lye, and that's exactly what we need, is um, soap with lye. Um, obviously modern soap, like at the Spirit Goat, is made out of vegetable oil, but um, soap from the Anglo-Saxon period would have been made out of an animal fat and have a really heavy lye content. And then I have ashes from my own grill here. so. Um, I'm not quite sure what they are. They may be charcoal ashes, but we would expect we would be wood ashes from if we're thinking a thousand years ago. Now we can skip to the end of the poem where it instructs the preparer to sing the charm, quote, on each of the herbs three times before he prepares them and also on the apple, unquote. Then we are to, quote, work the herbs into a powder and mix the powder with the soap and apple pulp from the crab apples. So um, we will do that in just a moment, but first, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the charm. It's not exactly clear in the poem which section is the charm and where the charm begins and ends. There are a lot of words there. I'm going to assume that the first part of the poem describes the herbs and then the charm appears next. So I'll recite some of the charm. I'm going to use a translation that I've adapted from several sources. These nine have might against nine poisons or venoms. A snake stung someone. Then Woden grabbed nine glory twigs and attacked that adder into nine pieces. Now these nine herbs have might against nine demons, against nine venoms and against nine contagions, against the red poison, against the dark or reeking poison, against the white poison, against the blue poison, against the yellow poison, against the poison in green, against the black poison, against the dark blue poison, against the brown poison, against the purple poison, against the worm blister, against the water blister, against thorn blister, against troll blister, against ice blister, against poison blister, if there fly in the room from east any oncoming poison, or from the north flying in here now, or any from the west over the world of man. Thank you. Thanks for watching that. That's neat to see that. And Donna, thank you for all of those wonderful images that are behind um, my talking there that make it more interesting. So what's super cool about this charm is what we call religious syncretism. And that is the blending or incorporating of different religious beliefs into one. Right. So this charm actually draws on Christianity as well as Norse or Germanic religion. And that is not uncommon for this early period, remember, because we have dramatic tribes and then we have the Danes coming. And so we expect there to be some kind of blending. And an example of this for the 10th century on the left is a really tall cross from Cumbria and Northern England. So you see how tall it is. And then on the right, what you get is actually a Norse image on the Christian cross. 
and it's an engraving and it's probably Fenra Rule, either with Odin or with Heimdallr, who is the one who is watching for the end for Ragnarok to come and who calls and warns the gods. So um, what, like I said, just like we have this, um, this cross that shows how Christianity and Norse religion come together. We have the same thing happening in the poem. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay. And so as I mentioned here, these, this draws on both Norse and Germanic religion of Christianity. And so on here, I just mentioned some of the things that the religions have in common, which you might not have realized. There is a snake, a really famous snake, a world snake in Norse, and the snake in the Garden of Eden. We have the importance of the numbers three and nine, which occur in the poem, which are both Christian uh, as well as Norse. We also have this image of Christ on the cross and Odin on Yggdrasil. Odin hangs on the, the, the world tree. We have an apocalyptic end of the world that happens in both religions. And interestingly, we have uh, Christian graves where people are buried with crosses in England, and they also have Thor's hammer. <laughs> Right? So you could have both religions uh, at once in a way. So the question, the important question about this is does that nine herbs charm reflect the Norse religion, which the Scandinavians, the Vikings brought with them in the year 800 and 900, or might it reflect the earlier Germanic migrations? And if it did that, then this is the oldest poem that we have in the English language. So if it comes from pre-Christian England, from you know the pre-600 when the Germanic peoples come, then this is our actual oldest poem that we have. So next slide, please. So why do these recipes matter today? And they matter today because actually people are making these recipes and creating antibiotics from them. So not only are they valuable for the history and for you know, those of us who are, you know, get really excited over old poems and learning about different cultures, but there is actually in 2015, there is a group in Nottingham in England um, who announced that they made uh, an antibiotic that kills MRSA from a 1,000 year old onion and garlic remedy. And this is on the right. This is from another manuscript that has recipes. It's called Bald's Leech Book, right? His remedy book from the mid 10th century. And on the, on the left under that photograph of that recipe, <laughs> you see the recipe. It's equal amounts of garlic and another onion or leek, finely chopped and crushed into a mortar for two minutes, add some English wine taken from a historic vineyard near Glastonbury, dissolve salts in a distilled water, add them and keep chilled for nine days at four Celsius, and they actually made a, a brand new antibiotic. So can I have the next slide, please? So one of the questions we have is perhaps this nine herbs charm can also be a powerful antibiotic, a brand new antibiotic. But we have some challenges with this is that medieval recipes don't say how much of an ingredient to use, how long to cook something, at what temperature. So that's where the experimentation comes in. So maybe that ancient biotics project at Nottingham will experiment with this charm, or maybe they have been, but they haven't announced anything yet. So if you can show this set, just the last part of the video, Jonah, please. <laughs> So having set the charms over the herbs while I work with them in the mortar and pestle, now it says we are to work the herbs into a powder, which we've done. Mix the powder with the soap and apple pulp from the crab apples. So here I have my powder, and I'm going to put the pulp in from the crab apples. That's good. And I have my soap here from the spirit goat. It's going to go in it. Now here's the confusing part. <laughs> and this is, again, part of the problem with the with the Old English is a little bit corrupted and so translation is difficult. It looks like it's saying, make a paste from the water and the ashes. Take fennel, boil it in the paste, and boil it with the mixture when the salve is applied both before and after. Then when it's done, sing the charm into the man's mouth and into both ears and over the wound before he applies the salve. So those instructions are a little confusing because we've mentioned fennel twice now. But it could be that there are two different ways to make this, or what I've determined here, I'm just going to cook this all up with some water and make the paste. So I have just boiled um, up our mixture here, and um, it looks delicious, almost good enough to eat. <laughs> but I scooped some out and put it into my little bowl here, and I couldn't help but show off one of my very pride and joy of my tea towel collection from um, before the marriage of 
Prince Charles and Lady Diana. <laughs> so we're just going to let this cool for a little bit and then I will use Alexa as my guinea pig. And Alexa has a wound on her middle finger. So I have already stung the charm into her mouth and both her ears. And now I'm just going to say a couple words over the wound before I apply this salve. So let me just quickly find my charm here. Here we go. And so I'm just going to sing just a couple things here. Now these nine herbs have might against nine demons, against nine venoms, and against nine temptations, against the red poison, against the darker re leaking poison. Here goes the poultice, and here we have this wonderful medieval band-aid. And there we go. Does it stick? <laughs> <laughs> it stings, but that must mean it's pulling out the poison. Okay, thank you, Alexa. We'll have to report back and hear how it feels. <laughs> Thank you. And I just have, I think, one or two more slides, uh, Alex. Okay, so just to finish up here, there are other recipes and charms in the Lac Nunga that might reveal future cures. And I just have two different examples here. Um, and there are many, but here's an excerpt for, from a poem called For Delayed Birth. Or parts of the poem are for a woman who haven't been able to carry a child to term. And again, we're going to start off with some kind of um, repeated poetic um, incantation. Let that woman who cannot nourish her child walk to the grave of a departed person and then step three times over the burial and then say these words three times. This is my remedy for the hateful late birth. This is my remedy for the oppressive heavy birth. This is my remedy for the hateful lame birth. And over here we have against a sudden stitch, which sometimes is, I think, translated as against a dwarf, <laughs> but we think it's like the sudden stitch where you get a sudden pain. And the first part again is a little incantation. They were loud, yes, loud, when they rode over the burial mounds. They were fierce when they rode across the land. Shield yourself now, you can survive the strife. Out, little spear, if there is one here within. And then if I could just have my last slide, please. So thank you very much. And I will end on one of my very favorite medieval medical images. I love to look at the very different colors of urine that they imagined <laughs> from the Middle Ages. And this is from much later from a 15th century medical miscellany where they would diagnose people through urine. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Christy. I, that's, it's fascinating. And I, we're, we're gonna move on to Alexa, but I did have one question to maybe kind of transition between the two of you. So you mentioned that um, this is only available in this one manuscript. So why is this one so famous? Because, you know, as I was kind of doing a little research on it, it did seem that it was kind of a famous charm. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is so famous because it, A, it is a metrical charm, so it's a poem. And um, the, we, so there's a whole, we don't have a lot of old English poems. We have Beowulf, for example, and we have some other things. So the poems are kind of held up here with the status, you know, they're right up here. But also we imagine there probably were other, there were there other examples of this, right? What we have that survives from that period of time in England are relatively few manuscripts. And that's because the language changed so much after the Norman conquest in 1066. So many old English manuscripts were destroyed. So for example, Beowulf only exists in one manuscript. Right, and so it is very common to only to have these poems that only exist in one, but probably existed in many more previously. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because as I noted in my introduction of Alexa's book, uh, this Regiment Sanitatis was in many, many editions. So I'm gonna pass off to Alexa now and she's going to, to move us forward about three or 400 years. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you so much, Christine. That was um, fun to see it all put together. And um, just, you know, my finger is in great shape. So it must have worked. Um, yeah, we can start with the first slide. So as um, Christine remarked, there aren't really recipes from the early and high middle ages, you really only start getting cookbooks a little bit later on. But what you do have from the period between, you know, 400 and about 1400 
is a lot of advice on how to eat. So can I have the next slide, please? In the Middle Ages, people thought a lot about how what they ate affected their physical health. And they were also, like us, concerned with the morality of eating. Um, in a world where some people starve or are routinely malnourished and others have unlimited access to food, that, that creates a sort of moral quandary. So foods that taste good also might not be so good for one's well-being. And overindulgence can lead not only to physical malaise, but all manner of disordered behavior. So how does one eat properly to maintain the health of the body and the soul? Fortunately for the literate medieval person, there were then as now self-help books that could guide your choices, a sort of medieval version of eat this, not that. Can I have the next slide, please? Another parallel between medieval and modern times is that um, nutritional best practices were really the privilege of the and the luxury of the rich. Um, the regimen Sanitatis Salerni was composed sometime between the 11th and the 13th century, supposedly by a physician from the famous medical school in southern Italy at um, Salerno, and supposedly for a king or prince of England. So it originally circulated in Latin, as Jennifer already told you, and um, there's a manuscript on the right of a Latin manu manuscript of the uh, regimen, and it was translated into English in 1528 by uh, Thomas Pinnell. And after that, editions popped up like mushrooms after a rain. Um, the 1535 edition that we own here at USU is very early and relatively rare, but there are literally hundreds of editions that were published from the 15th through the um, 19th century, actually. It was still being used as late as the 19th century. So some of its advice actually is still widely followed in Europe today. I was told absolutely authoritatively when I was living in France, um, that drinking water with a meal is very bad for my digestion. And that's a piece of advice you find right up front in the regimen sanitatis. Um, the author actually scolds us, men drink wine, let the beasts quench their thirst with water. <laughs> so uh, wine, yes. All right, next slide, please. So it's organized, the book is organized into four broad sections, diet, the use of herbal remedies, the theory of the bodily humors, and the practice of bloodletting. And this reflects medieval theories of, um, or sorry, medical theories from the Greek physician Galen, who lived in the second century AD, and whose concept of the balance of the four humors was really the basis of Western medicine right up into the beginning of the 20th century. And there are still people who kind of believe in it. Um, you'll run across them in the sort of new age community. The goal of Galenic medicine was to balance your four bodily humors, to avoid an excess of any one of them through diet, lifestyle, and therapies such as purging and bleeding. Um, since the seasonal approach, oh, since environmental conditions, sorry, were part of the um, balance of the humors, there was a seasonable, seasonal I'll get it on the third try, a seasonal approach to nutrition. And this was a fundamental principle of the Galenic um, medical theory. So also the medieval world was agrarian, right? So the seasons were typically associated with agricultural activities. And October in particular was associated with a couple of things such as feeding up your pigs, making your pigs fat, um, so that you could then slaughter them in November and have meat all winter long. Or um, on the other hand, picking grapes and processing them for wine. And you see that here on the image in the right, which is from a little book of ours from the 15th century. Um, but there's an important preparatory step before you begin preparing, identifying and preparing the foods for October. So let's have the next slide. <laughs> So this is a text from the regimen uh, Sanitatis Salerni, 
And I think I just wanted to put it in here because I want to bust another medieval myth. And that is the typical Hollywood depiction of the Middle Ages where everybody's really grubby. Um, in fact, people in the Middle Ages followed the sort of cultural traditions of the Greek and Roman cultures that they looked back to as a kind of um, model of civilization. And they were pretty clean. They uh, bathed fairly regularly, not by American 21st century standards, but you know, um, and, and they really, in fact, there were only certain seasons when it wasn't advised to bathe in a tub. And in the regimen, it tells you don't bathe in a tub when it's really cold outside, which seems like common sense um, um, advice. They also washed their hands before and after meals and um, as part of the uh, religious ritual and also when they were ill. So um, frequent hand washing was something that you would have observed in the medieval world. Um, okay, next slide. One of my favorite parts of the regimen is the soliloquy by cheese. So here is cheese um, telling you that in fact, it's a really good um, way to start a meal. And I have an image here um, also from the 15th century of some people making cheese. So no matter what the season, the regimen tells us you should really begin your meal with cheese unless you have some kind of medical condition. So, you know, start with cheese and of course a glass of wine, never water because that's for the beast. And this uh, sort of ritual really reminds me, it's sort of nostalgic for me because it reminds me of my graduate school mentor, um, Harvey Stahl, who would always convene his PhD students in his office with a fully stocked cheese board and a bottle of wine. And before we could get into the discussion of whatever we had read for that week, um, we had to have what we called the explication du fromage, which is like a play on the French literary analysis method of explication du texte. And I would say that to this day, like 90% of what I know about cheese and wine came from those sessions. Um, so it goes to show that like a PhD isn't just good for making you into a nerd in whatever field you chose to pursue. Um, next slide, please. So Here's some of the advice that the regimen gives us for, um, for October. You know, it's not terribly surprising. It's kind of common sense. And um, to honor some of this advice, I am actually making my version of a recipe for chicken and milk, which um, is by the, you know, sort of popular chef, Jamie Oliver. Intentionally or unintentionally, Jamie Oliver created a very medieval recipe, which actually quite closely resembles a 1430 recipe from England for a dish called chicken in cretonne. So the basic ingredients are chicken, milk, garlic, sage, and saffron. All of those are mentioned in the regimen sanitatis as beneficial to our health. Cinnamon is a little more exotic um, and had to be imported from Asia mostly along sea routes um, from Arabia and then overland from there. So it was very expensive and, and only the upper classes would have access to it. Um, and I think this brings up something really important that I don't wanna overlook, um, which is the centrality of Islamic lands to the sort of culture and cuisine of Western Europe. That is to say, even Galenic medicine wasn't handed down directly from the Greeks to the medieval Europeans. It actually passed through translation into Arabic and then through Latin and into European languages. And likewise, a lot of the foods, the, the sort of prestige foods that they ate, especially spices, came via um, either the Mediterranean or up to the Arabian, the Gulf of Arabia. So um, I think that's really important to recognize. Okay, so now you're gonna see me cooking a little bit, um, this chicken dish. I'm gonna start by salting and peppering my chicken. The recipe says to do so aggressively, but I think I'll just do it with my normal demeanor. Aggressively peppering my chicken. I'm 
gonna melt some butter. So I've got some butter here and some lovely extra virgin olive oil. And I'm gonna melt this down so it gets nice and melty. This is my little mise en place that I did with my cinnamon sticks and my saffron, lemon, sage, garlic, and goat milk. And the next stage of this recipe is gonna be super messy because it involves frying the chicken in the butter and oil, which is a little crazy from my point of view, but I kind of see what it does. It's gonna create like a nice crispy skin on the chicken when we go to put it in the oven. So here we go. These are from the chicken. And I'm just gonna heft her over here and start frying her. Is browning up a little bit. The next step has us put in garlic, and they're not even peeled, which I think is a little weird, but I think what happens is that they kind of melt inside their skins, and then you squeeze them out of their skins onto, say, a piece of bread. One small cinnamon stick. I don't know what the measure of a small cinnamon stick is, so I'm just using a cinnamon stick. And now I'm letting them sizzle. I'm gonna add this milk. Now this is goat milk, because that was the recommended milk for October in the book I'm using. So there we go, some nice goat milk. It smells good, it smells mild. And um, our chicken just goes back in the pot now, which um, is again my Julia Child maneuver, kind of tricky. I'm just gonna slide her in there though. There she goes, back into the pot. And um, the last thing is just to take my lemons, which I've washed, and take a vegetable peeler and just peel the skins of the lemons into the pot. Easier said than done perhaps, but you just want that like outer part, not the, not the um, bitter pith a little brightness in the flavor. And these are all really classic medieval ingredients. Cinnamon would have been an exotic, but they did have access to it through overland trade routes, as well as seed trade routes. Everything had to come up through Egypt, though. I was telling a Southern friend about this, and she remarked that um, when they make fried chicken in the South, they put it in buttermilk. So I think this might have kind of a similarity to that. Now I'm going to cover it up and I'm going to take it off the stove and put it into a 375 degree oven. So here goes the chicken into the hot oven. And now it just um, cooks for an hour and a half. There you go. Right. So this recipe, which, um, by the way, is delicious, um, is really to me in many ways um, more authentically medieval than those like giant roast turkey legs that you'll see at you know medieval style banqueting halls like um, medieval times or whatever and it's also I think in many ways by following a modern recipe I was able to um, better capture some of the flavors and the sort of sense of what medieval dishes might have tasted like, rather than um, trying to guess at ingredients um, from a, from a um, you know, actual period recipe. I want to say that I've been to a lot of medieval feasts um, in the course of my career as a medievalist. It's something that um, people think that you're going to like if you're a medievalist, and so they tend to put them on for you. And um, 
a lot of the times it's not very good. And that's because when you try to follow a non recipe, and especially if you're not sort of already an experienced cook, it can turn out really badly. Um, the one exception to this I would cite was in Italy, I was on my junior year abroad, and we were invited to the palazzo of um, a living breathing Medici. So one of the descendants of the Medici um, family that ruled Florence in the 15th century. And he prepared for us a medieval menu based entirely on family traditions. And the flavors were, you know, often a combination of like what we would think of as sort of pumpkin pie spice type flavors and, and um, citrusy flavors. And I think that really stuck with me. They didn't have that sort of like sweet versus savory division in their cooking. Anyhow, um, from here, it's just on to the table. So uh, peasants and lords alike, dining and um, drinking. That's the next video. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll make sure she gets that answer to any other person. Um, from the rest of you, do you have any questions for our scholar cooks? Can I jump in and say Dan had sent me a question? So Dan, oh, Matt, Barney, are you okay, Dan, if I read your question? All right, well, Dan asked, who was the audience for the manuscript? I assume that common folk had their own sense of herbal remedies. Were the writers bringing folk knowledge to an elite audience or did they bring, or did they believe they were bringing new med medicinal information to the whole company and the community? So because we don't know who wrote this manuscript, it's a little bit hard to say who the specific audience is, but we do know that it's a monastic um, audience. And really, they really like to collect a lot of different charms. In fact, in the same uh, manuscript, there are some Latin prayers in there and also a prayer where you say a prayer over each part of the body, and then you ask for protection against demons. So I have a feeling that probably whoever wrote it down or the monks who wrote it down or the nuns um, assumed that they were collecting it for their own community, but uh, perhaps also to share and just to, to preserve that knowledge. Uh, we also have a question from Dan for Alexa. Um, Alexa, if you follow Jamie, Jamie Oliver's cooking, have you found any other dishes that suggest medieval origins, maybe from his own Anglo-Saxon roots? Um, I mean, first I have to disavow any deep knowledge of Jamie Oliver's <laughs> Um I mostly actually associate him with that really ridiculous Uncle Roger video where he's making fun of Jamie Oliver cooking uh, egg fried rice. But uh, that said, I think traditional English cookery is, has made kind of a comeback in recent years. Um, and Jamie Oliver is certainly part of that, um, that sort of movement, I guess. Uh, I think that in, in a sense, anytime you roast a fowl um, and you add herbs and citrus to it, you're, you're doing something that's not just, you know, it, it's not just medieval European, but it's a very, very traditional way of cooking poultry that probably goes back honestly to the Bronze Age. Um, you know, people have been cooking poultry in, in a clay oven or roasting oven for for as long as they've been eating poultry, not raw. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, food archaeologists could probably tell you a lot more than art historians, because we can only look at, I mean, my scientific understanding of the archaeological <laughs> evidence is pretty, pretty, um, you know, rudimentary. I was curious about that image you put in uh, when you said uh, nobles and peasants alike. And I kind of looked at the image and I did see the, the clearly the lady very finely dressed. And then it did look like in the front tables, people from a different class. Is, was that a common thing for like, what, what was the setting there? What, what can you interpret that image for us a little bit? So that's actually a 15th century altarpiece. Um, and it's just a detail from a much larger composition. And it depicts um, a scene of the wedding at Cana. So the, the wedding, you know, where Jesus went and they didn't have enough wine or food for everybody. And he miraculously multiplied the food and the wine so that there was enough for everybody to eat. But obviously it's being imagined by that artist as a kind of a good time was had by all, including, you know, the, the, the fancy wedding guests at the high table and all the servants carrying on down line. Yeah. <laughs> so a, I also have a, kind of okay. genre scene. yeah. I have a question, uh, another question from you, uh, for you. It says, I'm wondering if the ingredients in your dish were meant to directly address the issue of balancing the four humors? If so, how? And was saffron as dear to cooks of that time as it is to us? Um, okay, so there are a couple parts to that question. The mm -hmm. food recommendations that are made in the regimen sanitatis salerni are 
all based on Galenic the humoral theory. So yes, like if the regimen is telling you in September you, or in October, you should eat these foods, it's because those foods are understood as building up the humors that you need and suppressing the humors that tend to be in excess production at that time of year. October is a time of year when it's like cooler and um, the days are getting shorter. It might be rainier. So you want to avoid the cold, wet humors, the things that are, you know, understood as cold and wet. And you want to build up the warm, dry humors. So poultry, because it's birds that fly in the air, is understood as a dry humor type food. Um, you wouldn't want to eat fish in October, according to this theory, because it's cold and wet. And, and sometimes they really make sense. And sometimes you it's not instinctual, but sage also is understood as warm and dry. So yeah, there's definitely like humoral theory behind the kinds of um, ingredients that are selected. Um, what was the other part of the question? The second question was about it, whether or not uh, saffron is uh, would have been as dear to, to people in that time. It, it's true, saffron cost a fortune. <laughs> yes, it would have been expensive. It would have been a luxury good, um, but interestingly, not as much as the pepper that I, that I aggressively sprinkled on the chicken. The pepper um, had to be imported from um, essentially Indonesia, from, from the Spice Islands, you know, from that part of the world. And so it had to come by sea across the Indian Ocean. And then it had to, um, usually it came up the Gulf of Arabia and uh, sometimes up the Red Sea and then overland there. Um, or it could be dropped off like in Oman and then taken across the desert in, in a caravan, essentially. So pepper and cloves and uh, cinnamon were far, far more expensive than saffron, which could be grown in the Mediterranean and indeed was grown in the Mediterranean from ancient times. Uh, I have another question for Christine. Um, Christine, the poem says that the charm is supposed to take care of things like contagion and plague, something that we need right now. <laughs> How would the poultice have been administered in those kinds of cases where there isn't actually an open wound? Oh, that's such a good question too. <laughs> um, so this one specifically is for a wound, but I think what they think about what happened, like what happens when a wound gets infected, I don't think they necessarily understand the biology behind that. And so what we are doing is you're drawing, you're drawing out contagion, you're drawing out kind of plague from the wound, for example. So I think those translations into modern English are more specific. When we talk about contagion and plague, we're thinking about viruses because we know what viruses are. <laughs> but I think when they're thinking contagion and plague, they are often thinking um, what we might think of as bacteria, for example, or an infection. So definitely it does specifically say for a wound. And at the very end, I have the copy right in front of me. It basically <laughs> says that you are supposed to um, uh, sing in the same, sing the charm into the man's mouth. It says the man's mouth that you're giving this to, and into both of his uh, both of his ears, and then over the particular wound. So the bubonic plague isn't there yet in England um, in the 10th or 11th century. That's going to come in the 14th century, and by then I think they're very much hands off. Right? You wouldn't you wouldn't kind of apply something because they they did understand that you caught it from each other. Um, so at this point, I think what you're mostly dealing with is I could imagine um, any kind of infection that would come from any kind of, you know, um, uh, injury with sword or injury with cooking utensil, you know, to be a farmer was the most dangerous, other than to be a warrior, right, to be a farmer is the most dangerous profession. So you're much more likely to be wounded by your equipment or while you're out working in the fields too. So I think of contagion and plague again as much as more um, again, more kind of bacterial infection here. I have to just say, Alexa, really quickly, I, I'm so glad you brought up the turkey leg at the medieval times because turkeys aren't indigenous to Europe, correct? Aren't they from the Americas? <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are other large game fowl that are indigenous to Europe, so. Yeah. 
Yeah, because like pet, weren't they um like the elite? Weren't they eating swans and in kind of peacocks and things? Swans, peacocks, all kinds of delicious fowl. Were peacocks and but you wouldn't just to Europe? <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah, you wouldn't eat swans. I mean, I think they're actually. I mean, they're, they're a Eurasian bird, but you wouldn't eat swans in October because of the um, the problem with them being waterfowl. So they don't, they're not associated with the air. You want air and fire elements in okay. October. And a chicken, which doesn't spend too much time in the air, I guess it spends enough time in the air to, <laughs> to be an air animal. It still has wings. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't live in the water. They, like I said, I, I mean, you know, the, the way these things are classified doesn't always make sense to us from a modern biological perspective. You know, we have to remember they didn't have like Linnaean nomenclature or yeah. any sense of, you know, the genetic relationships between these animals. So it's a little bit crazy, but. I have one more. Thing, like oh. in addition to being completely healed, that um, poultice <laughs> stung. It was really like intense. It was like putting, I, you know, iodine on a wound yeah. or something. Um, so yeah. you knew it was working. <laughs> That's exactly. interesting. Think... You didn't have broken skin, did you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I had like a little cut. It was really minute. That that was the left hand. The, my hand that was injured, I didn't put it on my oh. uh, broken, my whatever it is, torn tendon hand um, yeah. because I didn't figure it would do much for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we are wrapped up with questions. So I want to thank both of you for, for participating in our show and participating in the radio show. Um, I will get this up as probably on Monday for anyone who wants to share the link. Uh, Tammy, I'll have it to us. And um, then you guys can share it out with those who might be interested. So thanks again. Yeah, and uh, we Thank will you. be reconvening again in another few weeks to talk about uh, pizza and Roman, the Roman diet with our uh, cooks, Mark Damon and Dan McInerney. So oh, I have to ask, are we going to eat that? Are you going to make that disgusting garum, Mark? The fish <laughs> sauce? Is he here? Oh, he is here, yeah. <laughs> That's